Hello and welcome back uh, to this ninth lecture on microsystems fabrication by advanced manufacturing processes. Um, a quick recap of what we did in the last uh, lecture. So, we actually tried to um, uh, investigate the Shaw theory okay, and uh, try to predict the material removal rate of a USM process ultrasonic machining process by using uh, the Shaw's model. Uh, we also subsequently saw that there are two ways of removal of the material uh, where uh, one where uh, you know it is uh, the material removal is because of direct hammering action of the tool uh, on the grains and uh, the second way of material removal is because of a reflected grain which comes off uh, the surface of a tool and that is uh, impacted or that is that impinges onto the work piece and removes uh, some, some material. Uh, by flowing the material off. Okay. So, these are the two principal ways of uh, uh, doing USM and material removal subsequently. And we also found out that the depth of indentation H w the uh, amount of uh, impact that you know the, the grain would have because of direct hammering is much much more in comparison to the amount of impact that it would have otherwise. Okay. So, this is H w dash. So, H w is much much greater than H w dash. And then we actually investigated some trends of material removals uh, rates on various machining parameters like the amplitude of motion, uh, the frequency uh, of the vibrating tool head, the grain diameter, the average grain diameter uh, so on so forth. We also subsequently saw that there is a little uh, difference between the theoretical model uh, estimating the material removal rate of a USM process uh, predicted by Shaw and the experimental in terms of grain diameter and uh, what uh, experimental uh, studies have suggested is that the material removal rate is proportional to the single power of the average grain diameter a small d. Whereas, uh, theoretically predicted model um, uh, predicted the material removal to be proportional to d to the power of 3 by 4. And so, we saw how Shaw very nicely studied uh, a correlation between the, the projections on a grain surface and the overall diameter average diameter of a grain. And uh, by putting it into his theory, he could actually uh, balance the theory, uh, uh, you know, to to the experimental data which had come, and so we could have finally the MRRQ proportional to the diameter d. So, in terms of non-conventional machining, some of these uh, situations do happen where there is a force fitting of the experimental, uh, the theoretical model into the experimental world, uh, which comes into picture. But they have high utility because uh, the predictive theory uh, actually gives you. Uh, a framework uh, through which at least some of the parameters machining parameters can be very closely investigated as to how they impact uh, the material removal rate. Uh, and the whole purpose of any machining process whatsoever uh, are two three folds one is how or what the average roughness of a surf, uh, you know cut surface would be or what is the material removal rate or yield of the process is a very major aspect of all machining processes. Okay. So, so is that for USM. So, today we will actually do a numerical uh, design of uh, one such machining operation and try to estimate using Shaw theory what is the material removal rate which would finally come out. Okay. And for doing that let us look at this problem here. So, we want to find out the approximate value of uh, uh, time of machining uh, needed for a square hole. The dimensions of the holes are given to be 5 mm into 5 mm square and uh, it is actually in a tungsten carbide plate having a thickness of 4 mm thereby meaning that the volume is actually 100 millimeter cube. Uh, the abrasive grains uh, are uh, of diameter uh, 100 microns or so 0 0.01 mm and uh, sorry 10 microns or so 0 0.01 mm and uh, the feeding is done with a constant force of 3.5 Newton. Okay. So, the feed force or the F average of uh, the tool head is 3.5 Newtons. The amplitude of oscillation, the tool oscillation is about 25 microns, which is typically uh, the distance between which the tools operate. And the frequency of operation is very, very high. It is about 25 kilohertz in the ultrasonic range. And some other parameters related to the metal uh, are given here. For example, the fracture hardness uh, of the tungsten carbide sheet is approximately 6900 Newton per millimeter square. Uh, which which comes from the indentation test particularly assuming hemispherical indentation. Okay. So, it comes out to be 6900 Newton per millimeter square 
and uh, the slurry contains one part of abrasive and one part of water, meaning thereby that half the volume of the slurry is uh, containing abrasive particles. And uh, we assume that the, the coefficient in the uh, you know Shaw anomaly is equal to 1, meaning thereby that the diameter uh, of the projection is actually equal to the square of the average projected diameter of the grain. So, assuming this to happen, let us now see what is the minimum time which is needed to um, you know machine this hole, this square hole. And uh, for common sense or intuitively one can see that the minimum time will only happen when the tool head is having the same dimension as the dimension of the hole which is machining. So, tool head should be about 5 mm into 5 mm in diameter. So, that you know if it is any smaller then it would mean multiple passes of the tool thereby increasing the time. So, if it is at one go the tool head has to be of the same size as the size of the cavity or the hole that is 5 mm into 5 mm. And so, let us actually start doing this numerical problem. So, we already know from the uh, Shaw theory that the material removal rate Q you know MRR okay, is proportional to and this is the modified Shaw theory. So, it is proportional to the single power of the grain diameter average grain diameter small d 3 by 4 of uh, 3 by 4th power of the average force of the tool okay, 3 by 4th of the amplitude uh, that the tool undergoes and is proportional to the 4th power of the concentration of the abrasive grains in the slurry proportional to the single power of the frequency of the vibrating tool head and also is inversely proportional to the flow stress of the work piece uh, to the power 3 by 4 and 1 plus uh, hardness ratios of the work piece and tool to the power of 3 by 4. Okay. So, since uh, this expression only results in a qualitative aspect of the machining process. For uh, sake of simplicity, we assume that the volume removal per <laughs> great indentation can be uh, approximated by hemispherical volume. Okay. So, we assume that volume removed per indentation of the grain is approximated by the hemispherical volume 2 by 3 pi times of d by 2 cube, okay, where actually d is again related to twice root of d 1 times of h w, d 1 is the grain diameter or grain projection diameter. H w is indentation depth of the grain alright. So, that is what uh, the MRR <coughs> would really be. Okay. So, Therefore, as we already know that uh, we have a correlation between h w square depth of indentation and these other different parameters uh, force average times of amplitude divided by pi the grains in contact with the work piece per impact times of d 1 which is the 
projection diameter the grain times of h w 1 plus lambda okay. uh, and we already know that f average is actually equal to 3.5 newtons as illustrated in the uh, numerical design problem as such the amplitude of motion a is given by uh, 25 microns. So, it is basically 25 10 to the power of minus 3 millimeters and uh, the frequency nu is given by 25 kilohertz. So, 25 10 to the power of 3 hertz. So, MRR in this case uh, can be estimated by the total volume V which I already defined before as 2 by 3 pi uh, d by 2 cube okay, where d is equal to twice root d 1 h w uh, times of the number of particles making impact at one uh, cycle or one impact of the tool times of nu the operating frequency of the vibrating tool head. So, let us actually find out uh, what would be the z value uh, to begin with. Okay. So, what is z? So, as we already know that uh, the numerical uh, design allows uh, 1 is to 1 ratio of the fluid to the the abrasive particle. meaning thereby that supposing if we have a tool head here which is actually same as that of the hole size is 5 mm into 5 mm. Okay. Just for minimum time for the sake of minimum time I have very well explained this previously. So, the total area which is available of this tool is actually um, 25 millimeter square right total area available and this area has to be flooded by uh, you know a slurry between this and the workpiece surface which is situated down here. So, this whole volume has to be fitted by a slurry which essentially contains these particles in the ratio of 1 is to 1 meaning thereby the 50 percent of this area half of this area needs to be inundated with particles. And the particles as you know already are having an average grain diameter d with an area of pi by 4 uh, or, or uh, pi d by 2 uh, square pi r square. Okay. So, this is the area of projection of 1 grain. We have very well illustrated it before it is basically this area here right here of 1 particular grain. We assume all the grains to be of similar size by the Shaw theory. So, these are all the diameters the average diameters of the whole grain. So, therefore, the numbers which are available per impact between the tool and the workpiece here would be given by the total area to be flooded with the particles by the individual particle projection area. right? And therefore, uh, if we assume the grain diameter d as uh, we had illustrated earlier to be about uh, 25 uh, about about uh, 10 microns about 0 0.01 mm and we should be having a ballpark figure of what this z value could be. So, we assume a hemispherical impact okay. and we know that that for a spherical indentation test
for hemispherical indentation. So, this is also known as the Brinell's test. The hardness of the steel at 50 percent impregnation comes out to be 13 60 Newton per millimeter square. The problem already defines that such a hardness if you consider in terms of the tungsten carbide. So, hardness of tungsten carbide that is the work piece material for an identical 50 percent impregnation is given to be about 6900 Newton per millimeter square. So, obviously, the lambda value which uh, is nothing but the hardness ratio between the work piece and the tool as illustrated many times before comes out to be about 5 right 6900 by 1360. So, it is about 5. So, fine. So, we have the lambda value here we also have kind of a ballpark figure for the z value here. Okay. And uh, the z value you know if you consider um, the, uh, the value of the diameter as 0 0.01 is actually coming out to be about 159.235. So, so many particles are there between the this tool surface okay, and the work piece surface assuming a 1 is to 1 ratio of the fluid to the abrasive particle in the slurry. So, we already have the z value, we have calculated the or modeled the, the, the lambda value. And uh, now, the question of the grain projection comes into picture. So, as you know here, we had already assumed that let us say for example, this was the deformation that the grain surface had. So, the grains are represented by some projections of different diameters right. And this diameter here for example, of this particular sphere is d 1 okay. and the average grain diameter somewhere here is maybe about small d. So, in this case as I told uh, in the previous Shaw theory the uh, d 1 is proportional or found to be proportional to square of d uh, in this case as an equal to mu times of square of d mu is 1 in this case. And so, therefore, d 1 can be safely estimated as square of d. Okay. So, the d 1 value uh, comes out to be equal to um, square of the grain diameter and uh, the diameter of the grain as you know is 0 0.01 millimeters. So, this comes out to be 10 to the power of minus 4 okay, millimeter. Okay. So, this is actually uh, you know it is it is just a correlation uh, equation. So, it is not dimensionally correct though but then it is some kind of a correlation numerically between what happens uh, between the let us say the value of d 1 and the numerical value of uh, the average diameter of the grain d without looking at the dimensional aspect of it. So, the grain diameter can be from experiments uh, that Shaw did over a microscope predicted as about 10 to the power of the this is the effective grain diameter 10 to the power of minus 4 millimeters of the surface. And while doing this uh, there is an indentation h w that the grain would like to have on the surface here. So, this h w as you know has already been predicted by the equation 8 f average times of <coughs> amplitude of motion of the tool head divided by pi z d 1 h w times of 1 by lambda. We already know what d 1 is okay, from here, we already know what the lambda value is it is about 5 which we calculated here the z value earlier came out to be about 159,235. So, even we know the z value the average force uh, has already been illustrated before as uh, in, the, in, the, in the numerical problem to be 3.5 Newtons 
So, this comes out to be 3.5 Newtons. The amplitude of motion of the tool, the oscillation of the tool is about 25 microns, which means about 25 10 to the power of minus 3 mm. So, putting all these values here, the value of H w can be predicted as 0 0.5 0 0 0 6 mm ok. So, that is about it the indentation depth. So, one thing that I would be very carefully looking at is that consider or think about the magnitude of uh, the indentation that is happening on a surface. So, it is only about close to 0 0.6 microns ok. So, even it is not even 1 micron. So, which means that the, the surface finish of such a process is expected to be very, very high ok. So, it is less than a micron finish about 600 nanometers up to which the indentation of a single grain of size of about 10 microns can go for a magnitude of force which is as high as 3.5 Newtons with an operating frequency of 25 kilohertz of the tool head and uh, you know uh, and that too in a very hard surface of tungsten carbide ok. So, that is about the level of finish of such surfaces and therefore, from a conventional machining standpoint these uh, processes seem to have a better finish, better degree of finish of the surface the work piece on which they are operating. Although their yield may be very small as I will just illustrate uh, in the next uh, you know set of calculations where we try to calculate the time that is needed for completely machining this square hole on the uh, thick plate or about 4 mm thick plate of uh, tungsten carbide. Okay. So, let us look at Q now. So, the value of Q <coughs> is estimated as because it is a hemispherical indentation this 2 by 3 pi d 1 h w to the power of 3 by 2 times of the value of z times of nu. Z is basically the uh, particles per impact and nu is the frequency and uh, we if you plug in all the values for example, what this d 1 would be we have already predicted what is this h w uh, you know this about 0 0.0006 about 0 0.6 microns that we have again predicted. Uh, the z value is about 159,235 nu of course, is a very high frequency of uh, 25 kilohertz. So, with all this on there the amount of uh, you know q that you can calculate out is coming out to be about point 122 millimeter cube per second ok. So, this is not really a very high amount uh, as is obvious from some of the conventional machining processes where uh, you know it can be hundreds of millimeter cube of material coming per second ok. So, therefore, this process although on a uh, comparative basis with a conventional process may not yield a very high uh, material removal rate or yield, but does have a very high surface finish and that is one of the reasons why for micro systems fabrication standpoint where material removal rate may not be the key component really, but what is do uh, what does uh, play a significant role is the surface finish. Uh, these processes are pretty important ok and they can uh, actually look at a domain of processes where an, uh, an overall surface roughness which is acceptable to the micro systems engineering world can be achievable along with a reasonably ok material removal rate. Because some of the so called MEMS processes which are conventional MEMS processes may take a huge amount of time generate a lot of uh, waste for uh, doing processing applications of some of these you know MEMS devices. So, if we compare the non conventional process uh, in comparison to micro systems conventional technology process I, I would say that the non conventional processes would be a high yield uh, in the micro systems uh, arena with a reasonable amount of surface finish that these processes impart. And so, therefore, the flexibility of these processes or the way that these processes can be executed to build micro systems as such uh, is higher in comparison to the conventional MEMS grade processes, which are available mostly from the silicon industry or the polymer uh, MEMS industry. So, let us actually look at how much uh, time is needed for machining this hole. So, uh, the square area. So, the volume of the material that has to be removed as you know it is a 5 mm into 5 mm square hole with a 4 mm uh, depth. So, it is 5 into 5 into 4 about 100 cubic millimeter ok. 
and uh, you know the amount of time that is needed. So, the time needed for material removal becomes 100 divided by 0 0.122, uh, which is about 13.66 minutes. Okay. So, a plate of about 4 mm thickness of tungsten carbide, uh, where an area of 25 square millimeter need to be removed on the plate would take about 13.66 minutes okay, to get machined or removed. So, it is really not a very um, <coughs> uh, high yield process in comparison to some other method like maybe drilling, which exists in the conventional world. But the advantage here as I told you is that you can really focus very narrow using masking technology and you can also ensure that you have a reasonable amount of surface finish okay, or surface roughness in microns which can come or, or in a fraction of a microns which can come automatically by virtue of the nature of the process. Okay. So, that is how uh, we have. So, if you look at really the actual time this is theoretically predicted time. Okay. We should mind that that is a theoretically predicted time, but if you look at really the actual time of the process well the actual time is uh, much much more than the theoretical time. because we are assuming that this process uh, is 100 percent efficient. That means, one impact is producing a flow, but that may not be the case, because you think about it that if there are lot of uh, abrasive particles packed in the slurry, there is a possibility that there would be intergrain collisions, there would be collisions with the debris as such which gets generated. And there is a huge amount of chaos or randomness in the system of the particles, the debris floating around in, in the slurry material. And therefore, the amount of uh, you know material removal may not really proportionately be uh, varying on the amount of grains which are impacting the surface. Some of the grains for example, may have reduced momentum while they go close to the surface uh, particularly in the free flow case and in the direct hammering case also there may be a case where there is uh, a grain on grain because of which some complete crushing action may happen of one of the grains because of higher forces. Okay. So, all these uh, sort of necessitate the process to be less than 100 percent efficient. Okay. So, if you look at the process typically it may take several more minutes about 30 minutes or 40 minutes for the whole process to get uh, formulated, which can be even up to the extent of 2 to 4 times of the predicted values. And uh, therefore, this is only an ideal case to give you a ballpark uh, understanding of what could be time of removal of uh, material for such a process. So, uh, basically, let us look at a slightly different connotation now uh, and let us see the impact of uh, change of tool material on uh, uh, the machining time particularly in a uh, USM process. So, let us say uh, we have this example here, where we want to determine the percentage change. in the machining time for an USM <coughs> operation cutting let us say a tungsten carbide plate. Okay. When the tool material is changed from copper to stainless steel. Okay. So, intuitively one can really assume that uh, what should change really is the lambda value. Lambda as you know already is the hardness of the work piece by hardness of the tool okay. and the tool material is changing from copper to stainless steel SS. So, therefore, because of the impact here the overall lambda value should change. So, if supposing we had uh, uh, for the different uh, tools Q S and uh, Q C as the two MRRs for stainless steel and copper okay, respectively. So, we can easily write that Q C by Q S. Okay, is actually equal to because nothing else varies. It's only the lambda 
which is wearing the work piece remaining the same tungsten carbide. Okay. So, basically the lambda varies typically between uh, lambda c which is actually equal to h w c tungsten carbide by h copper okay, to lambda s where lambda s is h tungsten carbide by hardness of s s okay, stainless steel. So, q c by q s comes out to be equal to 1 by lambda stainless steel s by 1 plus lambda copper c to the power of 3 by 4 for obvious reasons uh, from the Shaw theory and the prediction and the approximation that has been discussed before, uh, where we find out that q c is proportional to the inverse of uh, 1 plus lambda uh, power 3 by 4. So, uh, therefore, uh, supposing we, we, we consider these two aspects here lambda c and lambda s in both of the cases uh, as we can find out the uh, you know both lambda c as well as lambda s uh, are much higher in value than 1. So, we can safely assume uh, this 1 to be negligible here. So, 1 plus lambda c or 1 plus lambda s can be approximated by uh, the lambda c and lambda s value. You already observed before that for uh, a steel tool earlier this lambda uh, for s was about 5 okay, which is uh, bigger in comparison to 1. So, you can easily safely neglect the uh, 1 and make it equal to uh, the ratio of both the lambdas. So, this can actually be represented as lambda s by lambda c to the power of 3 by 4 and uh, that would eventually mean that uh, the lambda s uh, by lambda c is um, h copper or the hardness of the copper by hardness of the stainless steel to the power of 3 by 4. Uh, the hardness of tungsten carbide is same in both the cases as can be illustrated here. Okay. So, we already know that uh, the hardness of tungsten carbide to that of steel is about 1 3 1 third and uh, therefore, q c by q s becomes equal to 1 third to the power of 3 by 4 and uh, this is about 0 0.44. Okay. So, we can easily say that the time of machining when the tool is changed from copper to stainless steel is basically equal to the total volume that you want to machine using the material removal rate of copper by the, the same volume by the material removal rate in case of steel is actually q s by q c. Okay. And this uh, actually is 1 by 0 0.44 about 2.27. So, you can say that the total time of machining uh, is changed by a certain percentage. Uh, so, that percentage change in cutting time when the tool is changed from copper to stainless steel is T c minus T s by T c is a product with 100. So, it is 1 minus T s by T c. Okay. This is 1 minus 0 0.44 times of 100 about 56 percent reduction. So, it is significant right. So, therefore, just by changing the tool material between stainless steel I mean copper to stainless steel you are actually reducing the machining time by 56 percent. So, as I already illustrated at the beginning of uh, explaining ultrasonic machining the tool needs to be a little ductile in nature okay. and uh, the, the harder or the brittle the work pieces the better it is in terms of material removal rate although the average roughness would go up. But uh, the tool certainly needs to be ductile because uh, 
the tool should be able to change its shape and retain its shape um, you know after every subsequent USM run. There is tool grinding of course which is done sometimes and dressing which is done sometimes in a USM machine. Sometimes tool heads are also changed uh, frequently uh, from time to time for this aspect. But then uh, you can see that if it is a softer material of the tool then uh, the indentation caused by the grain on the tool surface would be more in comparison to if the tool were a harder material like SS. So, when you have changed uh, from copper to stainless steel uh, the impact that the tool would have on the grain is more directly uh, fed into the workpiece in terms of impregnation of the grain on the workpiece. And uh, therefore, there is a huge amount of reduction in the machining time okay, because SS is harder in comparison to uh, copper. So, the selection of uh, the tool material with respect to a certain grain is very very critical to uh, the successful operation of a uh, ultrasonic machining process. So, let us uh, now, so we have kind of looked at uh, various uh, design examples and what are the different aspects of the USM process. Let us now focus a little bit on the, uh, the ultrasonic machining unit, how the machine would be or how the machine looks like and uh, what can be modified or what appendages can be given to the machine for particularly micro systems fabrication process. So, let us actually uh, see this uh, unit here which is the USM unit, it is a big machine and uh, as you see there are several components of this machine. There is a feed mechanism which ensures that the tool is fed at the ultrasonic frequency uh, of very high about 20 to 25 kilohertz. There is a position indicator for closed loop control where uh, it gives you an indication of where exactly the tool is spaced at a function of time and it uh, tells the feed mechanism whether it has to be moving towards the workpiece or away from the workpiece. And there is an acoustic head which actually uh, uh, is the, the, the head which is responsible for creating the ultrasonic frequency. Okay. So, this feed mechanism is just feeding the tool. Uh, and the acoustic uh, head is basically the one which creates a frequency. Okay. And typically as I will tell later this is uh, realized by magnetostrictive materials where uh, there is a change in the dipole, the magnetic dipole or the properties associated with the grains of the material with an ambient magnetic field. So, if you keep on varying uh, the magnetic field by a coil of current around that material it would change shapes and size, sizes and then it can actually uh, vibrate at a very high ultrasonic frequency uh, by an externally influenced magnetic field. Okay. So, the acoustic head is typically made of those magnetostrictive materials. So, that is one part of it the acoustic head. Uh, of course, the feeding unit which com comprises of the speed mechanism and the position indicator. There is also a manual drive to the system. So, you can actually manually uh, change the position of the tool with respect to the work piece. This right here is the tool head. Okay. So, that is what needs frequent replacements and this is the tool really uh, positioning itself with respect to the particles with respect to the work piece. And uh, the whole unit down here starting from the tool all the way to uh, the bottom of the machine is made is because you have to smoothly flow the abrasive slurry. Uh, so, you have a slurry tank here okay, and there is a pump which pumps out the slurry from this tank and it sends it into this cavity here and the cavity uh, is really where the work piece is immersed. Okay. So, the work is actually immersed inside this cavity which already comprises of uh, a flowing abrasive slurry. And so, therefore, there is a continuous uh, flow of the slurry into the work zone and taking away of the slurry thereby meaning that uh, the debris which is generated is also carried away by the viscosity of the material which would have the abrasive particles um, into it. Okay. And this work table is a very uh, heavy work table where uh, you, you can actually have a x y z position uh, ally, you know positioning or alignment mechanism uh, for uh, facing the different zones of the work piece with respect to the tool. Okay. So, you have in principle the following units the acoustic head, uh, the feeding unit, the tool, the abrasive slurry and pumping unit and the body with the work table. So, that is all uh, what goes into our sonic uh, machining system. So, we look at individual components now this is what the acoustic head uh, really is and uh, the function as I have already indicated of the acoustic head is to produce uh, a very high frequency vibration 
of the tool which would actually be in the ultrasonic range and it would be able to machine uh, materials based on that. So, it consists of a generator for supplying high frequency electric current, uh, a transducer to convert this into mechanical motion in uh, f uh, form of high frequency vibrations. This right here is the generator okay, and this is the magnetostrictive material, the transducer okay, which is actually uh, having a coil. Uh, you can see this coils here uh, coming from the waveform generator meaning thereby that if a high frequency is given to this coil then there is a change in the, uh, the grains uh, and so there is always an external magnetic field. So, supposing there is a uh, you know dipole moment set like this north south north south something like this and then there is an externally influencing magnetic field. So, this would change it is a shape on a certain you know the dipoles would rotate. Okay. So, it can go to this direction also you know and uh, it can go back again. So, overall the size of this material would keep on changing and vibrating on both sides. So, that is that is the case here. So, this whole thing is going up and down because of the change in the ambient magnetic field as done by the generator and uh, uh, that is what magnetostrictive material does and uh, there is a holder to hold the head of course. So, this whole uh, you know uh, system here is the holder and the holder has uh, also some fluid which is a cooling fluid uh, for particularly this uh, current coil or uh, because it produces a lot of eddy currents okay, in the magnetostrictive material as such when there is a magnetic field and uh, somehow it has to be uh, also cooled simultaneously. So, that it goes to certain temperature. Uh, the uh, there is a concentrator to mechanically amplify the vibrations while transmitting it to the tool. The tool is kept at the end of this concentrator. So, this shape here is actually by design. Okay. So, whatever vibrations are emanating out of the magnetostrictive material can be focused onto the tool very sharply. Uh, so, that you have uh, less wobble in this direction and more vibrations in this direction. Okay. And uh, most of the transducers actually as I already told you will you know works on this magnetostatic principle uh, particularly because uh, it is highly reliable in high frequency ranges 15 to 30 kilohertz is typically the operation frequency range of a USM tool and it also has low supply voltage and simple cooling arrangement which prevents uh, the heating of this core okay, the magnetostrictive core of the particular uh, uh, transducer. And further uh, you know uh, losses can be reduced by stampings uh, as uh, just as a way you use in transformers where there is some uh, adhesive bonded between the various uh, stampings. So, that uh, currents may not be produced uh, you know uh, in the bulk it may be limited to these stampings as such. Okay. So, the dimensions are so chosen that the natural frequency uh, sort of coincides with the electrical supply frequency and so you have uh, everything done in resonance mode okay. and so all the vibrations which are generated by less amount of signal from the generator is first amplified using this or uh, first super concentrated using this concentrator and then also this whole system is on operating in resonance mode thereby meaning that amplitudes of motions would be very large for a small amount of vibration. So, the full utilization of generator power can be made that way. So, that is how the acoustic head is uh, made in a ultrasonic machining system. The other aspect of the system is uh, how these uh, you know uh, concentrators work and uh, as I already told you that the main purpose of the concentrator is to increase the amplitude uh, to the level of <coughs> to the level that is needed for cutting. So, uh, you can see that for a small vibrations uh, which are felt here uh, the there is a sort of amplification in the amplitude as you go from one end of the concentrator to the other okay. and this is also uh, uh, a plot which shows how the amplitude grows you know amplitude of motion grows from the end of the transducer to the end of the tip. And there can be various concentrators can be exponential conical or stepped form of concentrators which would do the same job as illustrated here okay, in this particular figure. So, uh, you can see the amplitude of longitudinal vibrations of the transducer concentrator assembly is amplified. 
uh, and uh, what is important is that the system should be held uh, to the main body uh, at a nodal point okay, and that has to be very firm. So, that uh, the transmission is 100 percent efficient between the transducer as such and the concentrator. Okay. So, that is how the, the full details of acoustic heads uh, are. The other important aspect is the feed mechanism of ultrasonic machines. So, as I already told you the feed mechanism is really not uh, uh, the mechanism which generates the frequency of motion. The frequency of cutting is generated by the acoustic head as I told before. The feed mechanism is just to position suitably the acoustic head with respect uh, holding the tool with respect to the work piece. So, that you can actually utilize that frequency of the acoustic head very close to the workpiece surface. So, that you can have maximum cutting action. So, the objective of the feed mechanism uh, here is to apply the working force during the machining operation that is another objective. Uh, because you are forcing the, the vibrating tool head onto the, uh, the abrasives and there are various mechanisms uh, for feeding. For example, these are some intelligent mechanisms which have been shown uh, can be counterweight with rope and pulley. Okay is a concentrator, there is a acoustic head, there is a counterweight. Uh, it can be a counterweight with lever and fulcrum. So, this is the lever and fulcrum arrangement. So, you can have a counterweight which is pulling this down and there is a force arm ratio with which you are actually trying to feed uh, the concentrator. And then you have a electrical solenoid control here as you are seeing there is uh, again a lever with a fulcrum, but then the force instead of giving through the weight you have a counterweight and a core coil which pulls or pushes depending on the signal which is available to the solenoid thus uh, generating a motion to this end of the fulcrum okay, and thereby increasing the feed and these are all guided. You can see this uh, concentrated this acoustic head guided on a set of rails. Okay. So, as this motion is implemented uh, this end of the <coughs> fulcrum actually uh, tries to push the concentrated towards the work piece or away from the work piece. Uh, you can have spring control the same thing can be done with a uh, you know the k value of a, a static spring and uh, you know, spring can be uh, the energy can be stored or released depending on uh, the motion that you have to generate and uh, that in turns uh, would actually feed the acoustic head close to the work piece. You can have a uh, <coughs> In hydraulic or pneumatic arrangement as is illustrated here. Uh, there is a cylinder through which there is a piston which is moving up and down uh, by pushing uh, oil on both these chambers uh, simultaneously I mean you know alternately. So, that you can have up and down motion and that way we can actually feed the concentrator near close to the work surface or you can have a positive feed mechanism using a stalled motor which develops a torque through a set of gears. Okay, and uh, that is the principal cause of motion and of course, you need a damper or a dash pod for uh, uh, you know absorbing some of the uh, ramming effects of uh, this feed mechanism. So, these are the different feed mechanisms counterweight type, spring type, pneumatic hydraulic, motor type so on so forth uh, and, and these are used very often in most of the USM systems ultrasonic machining systems. Uh, the other important aspect of a <laughs> ultrasonic machine is the uh, the design consideration for the tool as such and uh, the tool is as you know a very important component. Uh, I told you already the tool has to be of a strong uh, but ductile metal. Um, you know uh, most of the times uh, it is found that stainless steel or low carbon steels uh, uh, you know act as a very good material for some of the tools. And uh, if you compare them with some other softer materials like let us say aluminum or brass. Uh, the, the tools made up of say soft materials were about sometimes 10 to 5 times more than the steel tools alone. And so, therefore, it is more important uh, in certain applications uh, where yield is more, uh, more desirable to use a harder tool. Okay. But then sometimes uh, you may have uh, your process driven by the roughness requirement that you want to generate in the machining and there a softer tool may work out to be better. because the indentation depth all automatically reduces because of a change in the lambda value as has been illustrated in the <coughs> shot theory. So, some of the geometrical features uh, which are uh, uh, there on the tool are really decided by the process. For example, diameter uh, of the circle that is circum circumscribed about the tool should not be more than about 
uh, 1.2 to uh, 2 times the diameter uh, of the end of the concentrator and this actually indicates wobble. Okay. So, if supposing the tool is of diameter d, okay, this is the concentrator here, the tool is of diameter d and this actually executes a diameter meaning thereby the tool rotates from this position to this position like this. Okay. Uh, there is a wobbling action which is happening uh, like this. Okay. So, so, the tool rotates like this. So, this diameter here of the rotation of this tool should not be uh, 1.5 to 2 times you know should at least I mean it should be less than that 2 times the diameter of the end of the concentrator here. Okay. So, that is how wobble is prevented. So, this is wobble tool wobble. So, these are some aspects that you need to be careful. The tool should be short and rigid uh, because of obvious reasons that if you want to control this wobble, uh, the shorter the height of the concentrator from the acoustic head the better it is and the more rigid it is the less is the wobble. And uh, typically if you, you can one, one way of doing it is to make the tool hollow. Okay. Uh, and when you make the tool hollow, uh, hollows, uh, hollow shafts of course, uh, are uh, more in rigidity in comparison to solid shafts. And uh, uh, therefore, the internal contour of such hollows should be parallel to the, uh, to the external one to ensure uh, uniform wear and thickness of any wall uh, or projection uh, of uh, this particular let us say concentrator should be at least 5 times the grain. Uh, size so that the abrasive does not go and indent and producing a hole on the concentrator. So, that should not happen. Okay. So, that is another aspect that the thickness of any wall or projection should be at least 5 times the grain size should be sufficiently thick for the grain to not indent and create a hole okay, onto the concentrator. And uh, in case of hollow tools the wall should not be made thinner than about 500 to 800 microns because after that there is a tendency of the grains to automatically. Uh, start you know uh, playing around with the shell of the tool surface and uh, some of the grains get reflected away and then they go into the concentrator. So, it is really not a uh, very wise idea for the concent concentrator material to be uh, thinner than 500 or 800 microns. Okay. So, when designing the tool uh, also the concentration should be given to site clearance which is normally of the order of about 0 0.06 to 0 0.36 millimeter and uh, this depends really on the grain size of the abrasive. So, if the hole that you were about to so, so let us say this is the tool and the hole that you were about to do is slightly higher here in the in the work piece as you can see here. Okay. So, this is let us say the hole size. So, there should be some clearance given for the wobbling of the tool. Okay. And so, that clearance is of the order of about close to sometimes uh, 60 microns or about 360 microns and uh, it is highly dependent on what grain size you are using of the abrasive. So, see there are some also some of the design considerations for the USM tool okay, which is uh, important. And then the final aspect of uh, USM system is uh, the abrasive uh, slurry and uh, most of the common abrasives that are uh, used are let us say boron carbide, silicon carbide, corundum, aluminum oxide, okay, uh, diamond boron silicarbide, etcetera. So, boron carbide of course, is the best uh, and the most efficient among the rest uh, although it is expensive. You saw earlier that in comparison to a normal silicon carbide, the boron carbide would have a uh, higher uh, you know material removal rate uh, with respect to let us say concentration okay. and the average roughness of course, will be more. So, that there is more cutting action. So, um, this is B 4 C and this is S i C. So, this was how Q would vary with concentration. Now, um, one aspect uh, is that when you are talking about glass uh, or ceramics or germanium or some of these semiconducting materials, I told you that this process is widely used in microelectronics sometimes. Uh, you uh, talk mostly about silicon carbide because it is sort of a soft abrasive okay, compared to some of the higher hardness abrasives like boron carbide, etcetera. So, the cutting time uh, with the silicon carbide sometimes is about 20 to 40 percent more uh, than the boron carbide. Although what is important though is that the high, the lower you know roughness average roughness would be realized using a silicon carbide material. So, if you talk about cutting diamond then of course, uh, diamond dust 
uh, is the only material which can be used uh, particularly for uh, cutting diamond or rubies or jewels and uh, so diamond dust of course is another kind of abrasive which uh, can be used for the USM process. And when we talk about the fluid uh, most of the suspensions are made in water. Uh, so, the slurry contains the water as the other part the abrasive in, in, in abrasive or you know sometimes other liquids like benzene or uh, glycerol or oils uh, are used which makes uh, the viscosity slightly go up. So, there is uh, at the cost of reduction of the material removal rate, but then uh, slightly uh, better dispersion occurs in terms of uh, the abrasive materials. And sometimes uh, in order to prevent coagulation between these materials you also use a surfactant which kind of prevents uh, the coagulation by formulation of a charged monolayer on the surface of the abrasive. So, all these aspects are there when we talk about preparation of the abrasive slurry. So, in a nutshell uh, we would like to summarize the mechanics uh, of material removal for a USM process is uh, really brittle fracture which is caused by impact of abrasive grains due to tool vibrating at high frequency. Uh, the medium uh, of course, is uh, the slurry uh, which removes the material which contains dissolved abrasives it could be boron carbide, silicon carbide, aluminum oxide, diamond so on and so forth. And the abrasive materials would have about 100 to 800 grit size which means maybe about 10 to 25 microns. The vibration frequency is about 15 to 13 kilohertz of the acoustic head and amplitude of motions realized therein is about 25 to 100 micrometers tool uh, can be made up of a soft material like uh, so a material like soft steel uh, which is much better than other soft materials like aluminum or uh, copper as we have seen before. And the material removal rate to the tool wear rate uh, particularly for let us say a tungsten carbide worksheet the work piece if you are using soft steel as a material uh, and this is the lambda ok. Uh, this, this is actually the ratios of the lambda. So, that uh, comes out to be about 1.5 and if the material is brittle it goes as high as 100 which means that the brittle the material is the better it is for the uh, both the AJM as well as the USM process AJM we have seen earlier. The gaps uh, that are uh, realized is about 25 to 40 microns between the tool and the, uh, the work piece and some of the critical parameters of this process are for example, frequency, amplitude, tool material grid size, abrasive material, feed force, slurry concentration, viscosity so on and so forth. And uh, tremendous amount of applications of uh, these materials are particularly to the semiconductor industry and because MEMS is a fallout or microsystems is a fallout of the semiconductor industry, we do have a lot of implication of using mechanical energy application like uh, processes like uh, AJM or USM in the MEMS industry as such or microsystems industry as such. So, some of the limitations uh, of this process are low MRR as I already illustrated it is a low yield process high tool wear and uh, of course, um, the uh, you, you have a limitation in terms of depth of cavity or uh, you know uh, the depth of holes that you can realize although in microsystems that is an advantage because the cavity that you are looking at, at actually is a uh, close to some tens of microns in thickness. And so, this process uh, is very well used in microsystems for uh, doing active fabrication. So, today we come to the end of this lecture, but then I would like to illustrate that in the next lecture I would give you a detailed overview of applications of both the AJM and the USM that is the mechanical uh, you know mechanical energy uh, based processes non conventional processes in fabrication of microsystems. Thank you. Mm -hmm.